Thank you, Seth. I'm glad you read that passage. I had intended to uh, read it myself in the sermon, but I forgot. So this is kind of what you've got uh, today. But English is my first language, <laughs> and uh, I'll do my best uh, to work my way through the English language. <clears throat> Uh, so grateful for uh, uh, Dan's outcome. Uh, that is a super blessing. And I saw him uh, Saturday when he was, uh, no, sorry, Friday when he was still in the hospital. And he had his sense of humor. And uh, he had the perfect recall of historical minutia that I, I had read yesterday and he remembered from 30 years ago. So a little bit loopy, which is was fun to uh, enjoy that out of uh, the man that fills this pulpit. But God bless you, uh, Dan. We're glad that you're with us. Our scripture reading this morning will be from our Old Testament, uh, particularly uh, the 43rd ch chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, you probably remember, prophesied during the 8th century B.C. We know that because in the very first verse of the first uh, chapter of Isaiah, he names the kings uh, that uh, ruled while he ministered. History records uh, the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel in that uh, century in 722 to 721 B.C. And that's the historical background of the first chapters of the book of Isaiah. The keynote idea of those chapters is condemnation. After a brief historical transition in chapters 36 through 39, the second half of the book in chapters 40 through uh, 66 concerned the 6th century uh, Babylonian uh, background during which Judah, uh, the southern kingdom, would be taken to, into exile in Babylon, uh, but eventually return under the rule of the Persian uh, king Cyrus. And therefore these latter chapters of Isaiah, including our chapter 43, must be seen as the result of supernatural prophetic utterance on the part of the prophet. And the, the keynote idea in these chapters is one of consolation. You know how it begins, chapter 40, comfort, oh comfort, my people, says your God. And we'll see that in our scripture reading. However, not all of this second half of Isaiah is meant uh, to comfort, uh, mixed in with the consolation, is a dreary reminder of Israel's past failures to obey God. If you read chapter 42, you'll find they've been deaf, they've been blind uh, to the Lord's word, disobedient to his commandments, and therefore God has seen it necessary to discipline them severely. And that's how chapter 42 ends. Uh, but then come these verses for us this morning, a, a beautiful song of reassurance. So let's read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 43. But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. This is the only time I'm going to interrupt our scripture reading, but that phrase, I have redeemed you, that's the perfect tense. Uh, but uh, experts in the language call that a prophetic uh, perfect because uh, it, it, uh, it interpreted means it's so certain that we can talk about it in the past tense. It's in the future, but it's so certain we can say it this way. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. 
since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and, and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this reading of his word. Let us bow together in prayer. I have a standard observation I make whenever some young couple I know have a baby. I say it religiously, and, and I mean it every time with all my heart. I want them to know that the births of our three children were the most wonderful experiences of our lives. Uh, nothing can surpass those days when those children were born. It's impossible to describe uh, the love of a mother and a father have for a newborn child. He or she is suddenly their special possession because they are the child's progenitors. Uh, God in grace, I know, brought the child into the world, but he did it through the parents, and the child belongs to them. Now, I'm reminded of those sentiments every time I read this deeply felt love letter from the Lord of the universe to the people whom he begat. Uh, read over the verses, please, and, and observe how he addresses them. Uh, they are those called by his name. Uh, they are uh, his possessions. They belong to him. They are precious and esteemed. He loves them. He is with them. They are sons and daughters. He created them for his glory. The love letter has an historical background, which we've mentioned in the scripture reading, as do the recipients. They are Jacob and they are uh, Israel, not twins, but two names for the same children of God who had, by the time of this writing, already an amazing history of conception and birth and trials and difficulties, but then deliverance and victory, but they were wayward and were soon to suffer the pains of discipline and the kind of despair that would seem as if it will never end as they lived in exile in Babylon. It's against this background that Isaiah, the prophet of Yahweh, Israel's God, brings his message. Uh, Yahweh, uh, the past creator and redeemer of Israel, brings consolation, announcing a new creation and redemption of Israel, and identifying himself as their holy savior who will pay the ransom for their deliverance and bring them back together again. It is a message of hope for the miserable, safety for the fearfully imperiled, protection in the midst of danger, reassurance to the guilty and doubting, comfort for the mourning, ransom for the captive, promise and certainty for the future, and unfathomable love. And so we read, but now, thus says the Lord, out of the darkness of unbelief and, and helplessness in the face of the punishment God's wayward children deserve comes the voice of Yahweh, uh, the covenant God of Israel with words of reassurance, promise, and grace. See who it is who speaks to them. He is the Lord, their creator, he who formed them, their redeemer, the holy one of Israel, their savior. This is the guarantor of the promises now given. Whatever their shortcomings and, and failures of the past, uh, Israel would never fail to remember and focus on this one fact, whose they are. 
After all, how does one even explain the existence of such a nation? Uh, traced back to the calling of one man, Abraham, a, a pagan himself at the time who worshiped other gods, yet out of whom came this great nation that still today attracts front page coverage from the world's news providers. Look at your paper. You don't take the paper, but find one. <laughs> Look at it. Front page today. It's Israel. Yet ultimately, its origins are to be found in the action of God. And the prophet emphasizes that at the beginning by utilizing the same verb used of the creation of man in Genesis chapter uh, 2. Alan treated us to Genesis 3 today, but go back to Genesis 2 and the creation of man. That same uh, verb is used here, the same miraculous care and genius that brought Adam into existence were expended in bringing into existence the nation of Israel. He is their creator. In poetic fashion, he goes on to express how the Lord also formed the nation. Uh, that's the same verb used of the potter who fashions clay, uh, thus expressing the absolute dependence of the nation's existence upon God. The old German scholar Franz Delitz thought that the two synonyms bring out the might, the freedness, and the riches of grace with which Jehovah called Israel into existence to glorify himself in it and that he might be glorified by it. The reference to such beginnings would have been most reassuring, but then the added reminder would have been even more reassuring. They are not to fear the Lord says, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Here is the substance of the reassurance and the promise to them. God has redeemed them. Uh, and that, is, of course, is a very familiar uh, biblical idea and deep in meaning. It's the Hebrew root word ga'al. And it has the meaning of making some sort of a payment in order to free someone out of a kind of bondage which they are unable to free themselves. Now, Yahweh reminds his people that he is their great Goel. It was in the Exodus, think back, it was in the Exodus from Egypt that he had revealed himself to them as their Redeemer. And now, he is saying that he will again be their goel in releasing them from their captivity in Babylon via a new exodus. The idea of redemption is important in this second half of the book of Isaiah. Uh, it appears at least 21 times in one form or another, typically with the backdrop of family relations. In that sense, as belonging to God's family, he is their kinsman redeemer, their goel. The idea of a family redeemer was ingrained in the Mosaic law. It's reflected, for example, in think of, of the book of Ruth, where Boaz, remember, must wait upon this closer relative to choose whether or not to assume the role himself uh, before Boaz is able to take Ruth into his own protection and, and marry her according to the Old Testament's leveret ma marriage laws. It was the Lord's intention in regard to his people that whatever misfortunes life may have brought their way, such as was the case with Naomi and Ruth, no one be, need be trapped in them forever. A provision in the form of a kinsman redeemer, someone closely related to them would be available to pay back whatever debt had imprisoned them and deliver them from their misfortunes. The result, that there was always hope, hope that the God to whom they belong would rescue them. Uh, the people to whom Isaiah's prophecy was directed would inevitably fear when the coming storms of life threatened to overwhelm them at that moment that the promises of God had failed them somehow. But this fresh promise of redemption was 
cause for them not to fear. God had fulfilled his promises uh, before. Just think back. If you were an Israelite in the 8th century B.C. in captivity in Babylon, uh, you knew of the deliverance of old, how the Lord had redeemed his people out of their slavery in Egypt in the Exodus. And now in this new Exodus, he would deliver them from their captivity in Babylon. Uh, but the meaning of the prophecy, and this is important for us to recognize, <clears throat> the meaning is not exhausted in the return of the exiles from Babylon under Cyrus the Great. Their, their return would prove to be a sign of an even greater deliverance, a, a more permanent redemption that would occur only later in the fullness of time when God would send the ultimate redeemer in the person of his only son who would make the definitive payment to set his people free from their bondage to sin. When the Lord says, do not fear for I have redeemed you, his words had a telescopic intent. They applied to the exiles in Babylon, yes, but they had an even greater application to all of those whom he has called by his name and thus who belong to him, like you and like me. After all, a plea not to fear would prove an empty plea if the redemption behind it was not one which set its objects permanently free. The blood of Jesus Christ would wash away all the sin that had imprisoned them as he would purchase them out of that slavery and make them his own. But I want you to notice something very important. It's the relation between God's redemption of his people and his calling of them by name. It is because Yahweh has called that he now redeems. It is divine election that is behind his willingness and determination to be their redeemer. You know how important names were in the ancient world, more than how we willed names. Uh, to name someone was to show a kind of ownership, uh, but more so here, the idea of giving a name has expanded to the idea of claiming for one's own possession and appointing for a specific destiny. The second half of Isaiah especially presents the history of Israel and all nations really as dependent upon God's calling. The Lord has called them by name, thus bringing them into a close relationship with him and setting them apart for special purposes. And therefore he proclaims, you are mine. Nevertheless, the redeemed of God will inevitably endure difficult trials. Uh, verse 2 addresses those directly. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. This is our reality, isn't it? The Lord does not say, if you pass through the waters, or if you uh, walk through the fire, it is when you endure the fiery trials, they'll be inevitable. Uh, the hard experiences of life are what we often condense into this concise summary. It goes like this, at any one time you're either in a trial, or you've just come out of a trial, or there is some difficulty lurking on the horizon that's about to slap you on the side of the head. In God's providence, these are a part of the human experience. It may be a trial of God's uh, discipline of you, or it may be intended to teach you some kind of a lesson that you need to learn, and there's no other way for you to learn it except through uh, the di difficulty the Lord brings into your life, or it may just be for uh, God's uh, glory. But it's not if, it's when. But there is a present and necessary comfort in his beautiful promise, I will be with you. Because of, the presence, because of the presence of the Lord, they would not be harmed. 
Now, water and fire should probably be taken in a figurative sense of standing for all the possible extremes of danger that we may meet along the way. But they have literal biblical illustrations of each, of Israel and the later early church were ever and always on a journey filled with pitfalls and obstacles. Uh, even before the birth of the nation, the whole world was swept away under God's judgment by the waters of the flood in Noah's day, but Noah and his family were spared. In the Exodus, I'm going to be mentioning the Exodus a lot, but it's in, it's in the background of these verses. It permeates these verses. But in the Exodus from Egypt, uh, God parted the waters of the Red Sea so that the children of Israel crossed over on dry ground. The rivers did not overflow them, and not one of them was lost, but their Egyptian pursuers were overwhelmed by the surging waters. In the days of Daniel, during the Babylonian captivity, the faithful and brave Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down before Nebuchadnezzar's idolatrous, idolatrous image. And as a result, they were cast into the furnace of blazing fire. But the flames did not touch them. And, and there appeared to the amazed onlookers a fourth in that furnace, like a son of the gods, according to Daniel 3, verse 25 with them in the midst of the fire. In the days before his death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus told his disciples in John 16, in the world you have tribulation. Take courage, I've overcome the world. And so the uh, disciples, the apostles did have uh, tribulation. James was put to death by uh, Herod, uh, Peter eventually uh, crucified. Uh, the risen, risen Christ appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road of, uh, to Damascus and told him how he would suffer much for Jesus' name's sake. But the Lord never forsook them, but was with them every step of the way, just as he is with us today. The trial that you're going through now, the difficulties, uh, the seemingly never-ending uh, problems, the things that are uh, making you less joyful than you want to be, He's with you. No matter the trials, we, the promise the Lord makes here in our passage, I will be with you, remains true every step of our way. Spurgeon said, whatever there may be of you, there shall be as much of God. Whatever there may be of your weakness, there shall be as much of God's strength. Whatever there may be of your sin, there shall be as much of God's mercy to meet it all. The Lord with you. His mere presence is the epitome of safety. But note now that there is what I would call an awesome particularity about God's love for his own. This is really um, one of the most interesting things about this passage that has arrested me for years, this awesome particularity. Verse 3, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. So this relationship is personal and particular. I'm sure you noticed the repeated personal pronouns you, I emphasize them, and the possessive pronouns your. First, as we've already seen, the, the Lord is your creator, O Jacob. He formed you, O Israel. He redeemed you. He called you by your name. 
And now here are these further particular representations about his relationship with his people. Uh, but first, in this third verse, he will restate in different terms, and now for a second time, who the guarantor of all this consolation is. It inspires confidence to be reminded again that it is the Lord, uh, Yahweh, their God, the very personal and covenant-keeping God, who is their assurance. In addition, he is the Holy One of Israel. This is Isaiah's favorite uh, term, favorite title for, the, the, for Yahweh, the, the impetus for it obtained, surely, uh, from the vision in chapter 6 of Isaiah, in which Isaiah beheld the Lord's regal glory and, and splendor. The young nation as well, who had stood at Mount Sinai and seen the otherness of God in nature and heard it in his covenant stipulations, would testify that he was indeed the only holy God. And those who had walked through the Red Sea with walls of water on either side until they emerged on the other side safely would have had no illusions that they had any other Savior than the Lord. Just as he had saved them in the Exodus, he promises to be there for them to save them from whatever dangers they're now facing or will face. But he doesn't stop there. In the second line of the third verse, the Lord seems to double down on the thought, saying, I've given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. And again in verse 4, I will give other men in your place and other people in exchange for your life. As you can imagine, students of this passage have uh, struggled, puzzled over the meaning, uh, uh, the meaning of it. Uh, Cush is uh, present-day Ethiopia. Seba likely was a reference to the people living in modern-day southern Arabia. Uh, Egypt, we, we, we know. Some have conjectured that the meaning was that in exchange for allowing the exiles to be freed and returned to their land, the Lord would give to Cyrus... Uh, those three nations as a payment, the, the ransom price uh, mentioned in, in the verse. Whatever the historical situation may have been, the thing that is clear is the principle of substitution. The Lord was willing to pay any price and go to any length to provide a substitute in place of his own people. So here again is the particular nature of his love for Israel. In choosing them, he was willing to sacrifice other nations, other men in their place, as verse 4 states, other peoples in exchange for their life. But the first line of verse 4 gives the reason why God has redeemed them and paid their ransom. It is because they are precious in his sight. They are honored, and he loves them. He was saying, in effect, you are dearer to me than the other peoples. Edward J. Young was a highly regarded professor of Old Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in the mid part of the 20th century. He wrote an excellent uh, three volume commentary on uh, the book of Isaiah. And on these verses, Young made a, a very astute observation. Love, he said, involves choice and exclusion. Love involves choice and exclusion. We could go around uh, the auditorium uh, here and confirm that many times over uh, with the marriages uh, represented here. Each one involved choice and exclusion. In the book of Hosea, think back, uh, the Lord portrays himself as married to the nation. He says in Hosea 2.19, I will betroth you to me forever. So here in, in regarding Israel as precious and honored, God singled them out for particular attention. I'm quoting from Professor Young now, and inasmuch as he so regarded them, he redeemed them. They were honored, not through 
works of their own or of their own deserving because God so regarded them. It's the same sentiment as can be seen in Moses' insistence to the nation in Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, a verse we read in here quite often. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. You were the fewest of all the peoples, but because the Lord loved you, he brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you. That is grace, unmerited grace. And this passage projects for us the free grace demonstrated in God's own Son, who, though he knew no sin, became sin on our behalf that he might serve as our substitute himself and give his own life a ransom for many. Not a ransom for all, but for the many. He gave his life for a particular people, uh, the sheep of his flock for the church. It is inscrutable love. And now the love song concludes in the final three verses, verses five through seven, with a repeated exhortation to his people not to fear because of the Lord's continual presence with them. But with this added promise, he will regather his people in their own land. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. Listen, there weren't any exiles to the west, if you know your geography at all. But he says, uh, I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. The surety of the promise is found in the immanence of God, immanence of God, which means he is ever present with his people, no matter in what far flung places they might be, like Dallas, Texas. To the world, it may look as if the promise is impossible. Uh, but God is sovereign and omnipotent, and he is not just remotely interested in the plight of those who are his own. He is so actively engaged, his promise is made as if it is a certain event. And it's made, notice, to the entire company. They are both sons and daughters whom he brings. They include those who would be uh, mournfully in exile in, in Babylon, but who made their way back home. From the four corners of the earth, he promises he will bring them. North, south, east, west. There is no place on the globe his arm will not reach. This means, what this means is the historical return of the captives from exile was only a fulfillment in type. Number one, they didn't all come back. Many did. The reality will be the gathering of all the offspring, see that word offspring, the seed of Abraham who were once far off and miserable. The Apostle Paul wrote of them in Romans chapter 9 and verse 6 where he declared that they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they're Abraham's seed, but through Isaac your descendants will be named, not Ishmael through the chosen one, through the son of the promise. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. The Lord will gather the whole company, all of the elect, everyone who is called by his name. And he will gather them to a specific place. That's at least inferred by these verbal commands the Lord gives. Bring, bring them where? Bring, gather, give up. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Uh, the return from the Babylonian captivity would not be from the ends of the earth and would not qualify as the complete fulfillment of that promise. This he will ultimately do when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And that is where they will 
ultimately be brought where they will be gathered. Everyone, everyone, the Lord concludes, who is called by my name. Isn't that interesting? In the first verse, he says he has called you by your name, and therefore you are mine. Here in the final verse, they call that inclusio. Here, I couldn't help it, sorry. But here in the final verse, it is the same people who are called by his name, by your name, now by his name. The two ideas are so closely related and combined to indicate possession and belonging. He owns us. He has begotten us, and we bear his name, and therefore we belong to him. We're called Christians. Well, the final verse uh, repeats some important truths from the first verse. We won't repeat those, but it also adds uh, the very important answer to the question of why. Why did our self-sufficient, almighty God, who has ever and always been dependent on nothing whatsoever, but who is wholly complete in himself, having the ground of his being only in himself, why choose to create human beings liable to sin and failure? And further, why Israel to be his own personal possession to the exception of others? The answer is here. He created them for his own glory. It was for his glory that he called them by his name. And for his glory that he created them and formed them and made them. It was for his glory that he called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and made an eternal covenant with him to make a great nation out of him and give him a land to possess and to bless all the nations of the world through him. The sojourn in Egypt, all those centuries of, of, of slavery, the, the exodus out of Egypt, the conquest of Canaan, the establishment of the kingdom, uh, the conception, generation, and birth, in other words, of the nation of Israel were all for his glory. So that the merciful and particular love of God for his own would be placarded throughout human history and we would be marveling over it even to this day. This is why we have hope. All of us who are sons of Abraham, because we are of faith in the promise made to him, fulfilled in Christ, who won the final victory over sin and death. Uh, the one who chose us and called us and redeemed us can be trusted to keep his word and protect us in the tribulations that come our way in this life. We are his children uh, we bear his name, and we belong to him. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago. I actually missed it, but I heard about it on a podcast. But the article was about Russia's practice over several years of embedding man and wife spies into the neighborhoods and communities of America. They integrated themselves into these worlds in order to engage in espionage and, and gain information uh, for Russia, which held their allegiance, the country that held their allegiance. There was actually a TV series that was based upon this called The Americans. I know none of you watch TV, but I, I heard about it. They were married, but not like when we got married. Not romantically, but they were married uh, to, to uh, everything that you could see. They were man and wife. But listen, they had children. In order to complete the deception, but sadly, 
the children were not in on the guys. They kept them in the dark, their own children. They knew nothing of their parents' real activities, but thought they were normal Americans with normal jobs, living normal lives. Recently, the intelligence agencies of the United States and Russia negotiated an exchange of prisoners. And included in the exchange was uh, one of these couples uh, with their children. The article said that, unbelievably, the children did not find out the truth until they landed in Russia. Can you imagine the feeling of betrayal those young children must have felt? The loss of, of trust in what they had always imagined would be true about their parents. If they couldn't trust the father and the mother who brought them into the world, who could they trust? We have a, a father we can trust. We know whose we are. He is with us. He will never forsake us. Trials are going to come. Difficulties overwhelm. Tragedies even uh, meet us on our way. But the Lord remains our refuge and fortress, our ever-present help in time of need. This is where Romans 8 comes in, Seth. <laughs> But as the hymn portrays, dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But there may be some listening today who do not know that sweet relief. The possession of it is a free gift. It is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. He is the ultimate a redeemer who offered his life an atoning sacrifice to pay for the sins of sinners and bring them into the family of God as sons and daughters. He died on the cross bearing God's judgment for their sins, the perfect substitute. You may have that assurance today. It's by grace that we're saved in that way, by faith alone in Him. So I call you to faith, uh, believe in Christ, and receive the free gift of salvation. The moment you do, you'll receive forgiveness of your sins, the promise of eternal life, and unfailing Redeemer. We're going to sing a hymn. It's a, a familiar one, Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. Let's stand and sing hymn number 223. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words of encouragement and reassurance, consolation. Uh, we have need of them, as you know, intimately, and we're so grateful that we have a Redeemer, um, you who created us and formed us, uh, you walk us through the most dangerous places and, and rescue us and, and, and bring comfort, sweet relief to us. So we're grateful for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would enable us by your Holy Spirit to respond uh, to your love for us in ways that give you glory, for we pray in Christ's name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.